Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Lord, I thank you for this uh, beautiful day here back at the beach again. And uh, with Lord, I thank you for this breeze that's blowing uh, across us right now. Lord, I pray for now that you would give us a blowing of your Holy Spirit to encourage us this coming week. Lord, we're just the sheep of your pasture, and you're the good shepherd. So, Lord, I pray that you use Pastor Izzy now to speak to each one of us to encourage us. Lord, and we do lift up our brother Steve and ask you to give him strength and encouragement mm -hmm. and cookie, too. In Jesus' Please name me. we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, guys. Would you grab your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 1? Um, we're to, to a, a paragraph that begins off in verse 16, um, one of the keystone verses. One of the first verses I learned from the book of Romans is this verse here, verse 16. I learned it actually on a t-shirt when I was a new Christian. It was a verse that someone made it into a Christian t-shirt, and uh, they quoted this. I didn't know it was a, vi uh, a verse in the Bible, but because it says right here, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And that's all they put on the shirt. They didn't include the very last part of the line that says, to the Jew first and then to the what? To the, to the Greek or the Gentile. So first salvation is to the Jew. And, uh, and Paul, the apostle, being a Jew, understanding the law, he said, this is, God gave us that promise, but it wasn't just to the Jew. He said it was to the Jew first. And then, it, then to the Gentile. And so we're going to see later on in the book of Romans, Paul will actually explain our role as, as Gentile believers is to be a stimulus to Jewish people. We're actually supposed to provoke them by love to draw near to God. And I've used the example of, of Pastor Chuck Smith having his, his um, little grandchild that wouldn't, grandson wouldn't come to grandpa. And so he was, you know, grandpa's like their grandkids that come to them when they come in the door. And he's like trying to get the boys to attend. He wouldn't come. So he changed his tactic. He took the granddaughter that came in and lavished his attention. Oh, honey, how are you? And, and he just put all his attention on her. And as soon as he did, guess what happened with the boy who was, oh, he was like, push her out of the way. Let me in. I want to sit on grandpa's lap. How come, I, you, you know, I'm important too, you know. And, and all of a sudden, it, it was so brilliant to me that relationship just showed how we can be as Gentile believers. We can, if you have a Jewish friend and you're like saying you want to encourage their faith, just share how you feel close to their God. You know, their daddy is your daddy. And because and, and we are, it says Jews by adoption as Gentiles. We're we're grafted in as wild olive branches. And so we come along and go, man, I'm so glad for you Jews because, you know, because of you guys, we get to draw near to God. And, oh, I feel so close to him. I'm so, don't you feel close? And they're like, wait a minute, how come you're closer than me? And, uh, and, and hopefully that will stimulate them to want to have faith. Because if you want to get argue a Jew over points of the scripture, guess what? They usually know him better than you. And they probably will kill you. In the, in the debate factor, they just, they're, they're wired for debate, okay? Now, me being a Sicilian and a little bit, and, you know, and, and my, my, my nona said I was part Jewish. I think she, she figured I was good at this debating thing. I was the captain of the debate team in, in high school. And I tell you, you can't use the law to argue. You need to learn what, what Paul will come to explain later, that we are under a spirit of grace, the law of grace, not uh, 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 of the letter of the law, but of the, uh, the, the spirit of grace of the law. Like the spirit, the law says that we should take a, a day a week to rest, a Sabbath. How many of you take one day off a week? Mandatory, don't do anything. Just honor God and rest all day. I got to tell you, even the pastor has struggles with this. I mean, I, I know in my head, would this be good for my body to do? Absolutely. But do I do it well? Not always. There's always something coming up. There's always something. And, and, and if I would do the holy days like the Jews do. I've shared this before. But you, you know that if you're a good Jew, between those 52 Sabbaths a year, 
You add that to the to the Feast of Booths and to the Feast of Tabernacles and to the Passover and to, to Yom Kippur, right? You put together all the five, the five biggies of the Jewish calendar, the Holy Holidays, you wind up taking a whole third of your year mandatory rest. Don't do anything. And do they do well financially? Because the big argument from the American Christians is, I can't take that much time off. I, how could my business survive? How could I make money? How could, and I'm thinking, you know, there is... My dad used to say to me when I was little, and I never understood it, work, son, work smarter, not harder. And I just kept working harder. And I realized now as I'm getting older, I, I need to listen to the spirit of the law. And take a vacation when I should, you know, and recharge the battery. And, and, and it, just having gone with our family on that last minute cruise that we got was such a blessing because we hadn't gone on a family vacation for five years. And I'm like, that was good. Someone asked me, how was it? I, to be honest, at the end of the week, I was thinking, I wish I could have a second week. You know, have you ever been on a vacation where, like, I, I honestly, by the end of the week, I was starting to feel... Like now I'm starting to rest. I didn't, and I don't know if that makes sense, but I didn't feel the rest right away. It was like, you know, you're still going. I, we get on the boat on Saturday. We, we call back in Sunday morning. Kai, how's it going? You know, and <laughs> they're getting stuff said. We're, we're working at it, Pastor. <laughs> and then where's this? And, you know, and do that. And I'm like, oh. And, and the mind doesn't just shut down and rest sometimes when we go on vacation. But by the end of the week, a lot of buffets on the ship. A lot of meals, a lot of working out, reading my Bible, just resting. I got to read. I shared last week with the, with the, the group up at my house, thanks to the hurricane. Thanks, Darby. We didn't get to uh, meet down here. So, so we were at the house, and I, I actually, got, instead of sharing this verse of Romans, I went to the Psalms. Because I got to read while I was on vacation, whatever I wanted. Because I wasn't like reading to get ready to teach you guys a study. I was reading... Like, hey, Lord, just speak to me. And, and I had a wonderful time reading some of the Psalms. And, and my spirit got refreshed. And that's something that I, I go, okay, I got to do this better. I'm gonna, I repent, you know. <laughs> I mean, it sounds weird to say, I'm telling you this because later I'll get in a rut and I'll keep working. You guys got to tell me. Remember what you said that we, we should do? See, and I don't want to be the, the, the kind of leader that says, do as I say but not as I do. I want to be the, the man that says, like Paul did, you want to know how to do this? Imitate me, he says, be an imitator of me as I am an imitator of who? Of Christ. Just copy me. Now, that means you must be doing something. You better be copying the Lord and setting a good example. And I think in our society, we don't, there's a trust issue there. Like if I don't work all those days, if I don't work straight for six weeks and, and, and not take a break, that somehow God, you know, he won't be able to provide for me. Is that true? No. He set up the whole Sabbath thing so that you would know that, in fact, on the day before the Sabbath, on the Jewish calendar, that's their Friday, they call it the day of preparation. They're allowed to gather double that day only so that the next day they're kicking back. And, and he used that whole manna thing, not spoiling for two days' worth. Only on Friday did it work. Any other day of the week, if they gathered more, what happened to the manna? Spoiled. Spoiled. He, he was teaching them, just every day I will provide. And on the day of preparation, I'll provide double so on the Sabbath you can rest. But do we rest, really, as a society? Do Americans take a day to just honor God and rest? No. Not as a culture anymore. We used, when I was a kid, if a grocery store, I remember Neb's Market decided to open on Sundays. This is in, in, in Phoenix area, in, in, in Phoenix, Arizona. And they, when they did, there was such a poo paw that was like, what? Don't, and, and, and they boycotted. People stopped shopping at the grocery store because they opened on Sunday. How horrible that you would not, you know, have, and I was like, wow. But today we've got 24-7 stores all the time. And you go in and you look at some of the employees and you can tell they have been there. Wait. It was like some of the people on the cruise ship that were waiting on us. Those guys go on that ship for six months straight without a break. Seven days a week they work. They burn them out. And, and, and Jan asked our waiter, why do you do this? He says, well, I get six weeks off at the end. 
Is six weeks worth six months? To some people, maybe, but I, I was like, you know, you look like a zombie. Here's your food. <laughs> you know, and you looked around the restaurant, and there, everybody looked like zombies. And it's not something that we are really, the spirit of the law teaches me to just look at the law and say, hey, what, 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 why is God telling us that? The, the Bible says he knows our frame. And he is mindful that we are but dust. He knows we need a little recharging. So when I look at the law, when I look at the scripture, I want to look for the things that the spirit of that thing is saying. And, and I love this verse because Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. He, he declared it. And that t-shirt I saw when I was a young Christian. I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation for how many people? All. For everyone who believes. It's not an exclusive thing. It's for everyone. Now, I really like the next verse because I know the background of it from the Old Testament. And I'm going to take a little time to show you it, okay? Because he's going to say in the very next verse, verse 17, For in this... In it, the, in what? In the gospel, he says, the righteousness of God is revealed. From faith to faith. As it is written, it says, the righteous man shall live by faith. Now, as it is written, means it was written somewhere. And, 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 and if you, I've shared this before, but we have some new folks to the faith, so bear with you younger Christians. You might notice in your Bible, different um, publishers, they, they signify a, a quote, usually by putting parentheses around it or little qu quotation marks, or they put it in all capital letters or, or a different font, in your, in your, depending on your, uh, on, on your publisher. But the reason they do that is to bring it out, out to your attention that this is a quote from somewhere else. So if you have cross-references, some of you will see little notations down at the bottom or right next to the verse and you might notice it says H-A-B, Hab which is short for Habakkuk in the Old Testament. He's one of the minor prophets. I love the name Habakkuk in Hebrew because Habakkuk, he would be cool in Hawaii. It means embracer. And it's um, a Hebrew word for the person, it's the embra but it's, a, it's embracer because the person is filled with the love of God. It has a spirit. It's like the guy who is the spiritual embracer that's because of God's love filling him. He, he you know, I mean, it's, it has like this really, uh, what's the right way? Positive connotation. You know, like if, you're, if you were Habakkuk growing up and you came in the room, what's your name? Habakkuk? They'd be like, oh, you're cool. You know, embracer, like, like the one that has God's love motivating to give that hug, that, that sweet hug when you know the person. Isn't it nice to get that hug from someone that has that love? The auntie or the uncle that they're just, man, you just can't wait to see it. You know they're going to give you a hug. And you just, they don't, it's just like, oh, well, that's Habakkuk. And he's the prophet that the Lord sent to speak to the southern kingdom of Judah, um, this is in the period of time around six, started around 609 BC. Habakkuk was sent to the southern kingdom to prophesy against them because the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, it's technically nine and a half and two and a half, but we'll just make it easy math. Ten to the north for Israel, and the southern kingdom is called Judah, and, and, um, and it's two, two and a half of the tribes down in the south. And that's where, by the way, Jerusalem is in the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom has already been carried away into captivity by the Assyrians because they, they, they didn't listen to the Lord. The Lord sent prophets to them and said, break off your wickedness or I'm going to bring judgment. Now, does God ever do that with us? Does he send warnings first before he brings down the hammer, so to speak? I mean, he always does. He's faithful. And here he's telling them over and over. And now he... The, the, the southern kingdom, which had some good kings for a little while, and if you've studied the scripture, you know in the book of Kings and Chronicles will be like good king, bad king. Good, good, bad, bad. But good, bad, good, bad. I mean, it flip-flops back and forth between a great regime to a horrible, wicked regime. And unfortunately, by the time we get to 609 B.C., we're at wicked again. 
and it's uh, Jehoaz is the king. He only, he's so wicked, he gets three months of rain, and he, the Lord gets him out. And then there's another fella, and um, this is in, let's see, 2 Kings 23. Let me just look, make sure. I want to say 2 Kings 23. Yep, 2 Kings 23. Um, then this guy gets put in, Elikim, the son of Josiah, uh, uh, of, in, in place of Josiah, his father, and he gets his names changed to Jehoiakim. Now Jehoiakim gets um, taken away to Egypt uh, because, well, he, he gives a tax to Pharaoh because Pharaoh is saying, I'm taxing you guys. And God uses the, the enemies of Israel as a, a, a paddle. I don't know what else to call it. Something to spank them to say, straighten up. And so they, they are getting a good paddling. The Lord's telling them, straighten up, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry you guys away into captivity. Oh, I forgot to mention. When Habakkuk was prophesying, he was saying, you guys better get it together, or God's going to bring a judgment. He's going to bring the Chaldeans against you. Now, this is so trippy, because if you study world history, the Chaldeans are over in Babylon, like 400 miles away. And they're not really in a power place yet in the world. And the Lord's saying, I'm going to make that king way over there be my next paddle. Only he's going to be a big paddle, you know, with whiffles in it and the whole thing. And, you know, big time, you're going to get a whooping. And, and so the Lord has Habakkuk prophesy against Israel. And he says, you guys have got to break away your sin. And he, interestingly enough, He's the one that Paul is quoting here, saying, a righteous man shall live from faith to faith. But he picked half of the verse out of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. He didn't do the first part of the verse. And if you know what's going on, Israel's wicked. The Lord's sending prophet Habakkuk to, to prophesy, and before that he had sent another prophet. And after Habakkuk, well, I kind of, I'll call him the contemporary handoff. The baton's going to go from Habakkuk to a prophet you guys really probably are aware of named Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is going to spend the next 40 years prophesying, repent, repent, repent. Do they repent? No. But here in the days of Habakkuk will come about something that will tie together some of the Bible for you. Habakkuk is the guy prophesying against Judah saying, you guys better stop your sin or God's going to bring judgment. The Chaldeans, the Babylonians are going to come and, 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 and take you. And sure enough, in his day, the very first invasion by Nebuchadnezzar will come about. And, and you guys know this. This is just to knit some Bible together for you. This is when Daniel and his, remember his buddies that, that get renamed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Abintego. I heard somebody made a coffee shack. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abintego. But, uh, Crack me up. They, those three guys and Daniel and a few others will be carried away by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon in the days of uh, 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 605 B.C. So when Habakkuk prophesies this, let me read this to you. This is a, written about 607. If you, if you want to like people like me, I like to know the chronological day. I can kind of pin it on the timeline in my brain and go, okay, a couple years before they get carried away, Daniel's going to be carried away. Daniel's actually in the audience. So I'm just like kind of painting the picture so you know what's going on. Jehoaz had just been creep, three months of rain, terrible, wicked guy. God took him out. And then Jehoiakim, who's going to replace him, is going to do even more evil. So he'll get paddled by the Egyptians. And God is going to then speak to them. And I don't know how. It's, it's a strange thing. They don't seem to hear you know, you've never had a kid that you paddled and said, straighten up, and they didn't hear, right? They, they always hear, right? You tell them, straighten up, and they understand. And, well, Israel as a nation was like a really bratty kid that wasn't listening. And, and here's what Habakkuk, the embracer of God, speaks to them. And some of you are familiar with this verse. Would you look with me at Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3? I can bring this into context that really brings out some richness when we turn back to Romans. But I gotta I gotta put you in the in the moment for this. Here he says, for the vision is not yet for the appointed time. 
It hastened, he said, towards the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. It will not delay. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by by his faith. Furthermore, wine betrays the haughty man and, and so that he does not stay at home. And he enlarges his appetite like, like shoal. He's like death, never satisfied. He also gathers to himself all the nations. He collects to himself all the peoples. By the way, who was collecting peoples at this point? Nebuchadnezzar. And he and will not all of these take up a taunt, a song against him, every mockery and, 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 and insinuation against him, and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his. For how long? And makes himself rich with loans. And will not your creditors rise up suddenly and those who collect, he says, fr from you awaken? Indeed, you'll become plunder. Plunder for them, because you have looted many nations. And, you, and all the remainder of the peoples the, you will loot you because of the human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to all the towns and its inhabitants. So God was saying, I'm going to take care of Nebuchadnezzar anyway. Does Nebuchadnezzar get taken care of in the end? We know because we got history, yeah. But before it ever took place, God said, the guy who's collecting nations, that Nebi guy, I'm, I'm going to take care of him. But but I want you to notice this. The verse that says a, a righteous man will live by faith. Lots of people quote that verse from Romans. But I like what it says right before. I mean, he plucked out half of, of the verse there, verse 4 of this chapter, because it says, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. When a person is proud... Th their judgment gets askew. They start to, in fact, even in the New Testament, this application comes out so clearly that, that we have to be careful. The Bible warns us not to walk pridefully. What, what's the, what does the, the proverb say if you, uh, pride goes before the what? Fall. You know, the haughty spirit before destruction. You, you don't want to get your nose too high in the air. And say, I'm, I'm better than those other people. I'm so good. When you do that, this is a setup for a trip. You're going to go down. And instead of being prideful and arrogant in our ways, it says that, that the right way to live is by faith. And when it comes to living by faith, faith is a walk of humility. It's not something that we, you know, get to boast, we're so good, you know. It, we, we, in fact, you guys know, we've studied in Ephesians, it said, Paul said, we're saved by by faith, but by, by what? By grace through faith. He says, not of works lest any of us could boast. We can't say, I'm saved because I'm so good and I did all these special things. No. It's just a gift of God. And, and we can't, you know, we got to be humble about it. Does God want to give that gift of salvation just to the Jew? Or just to the Gentile? No. He, for how many that believe is the gospel for? All. And we can't get haughty and think, it's just for me, or I'm better than the other person. Interestingly, last night, um, the college and career group, Sean had worked on a study for the, for the teenagers on Friday night, and I, I, I came back from the trip. I was a little burnt out. I just sat there in my easy chair, and think we were eating the, the food before the pizza and stuff, and, and I, I turned on America's Got Talent. <laughs> and it was the judge's cut or whatever, and so the kids... They, they had already seen a few of the episodes, you could tell, and they're like, this guy's good, wait, wait, wait. And, and so we're pretty soon the whole room's full, and we're all eating, and we're watching America's Got Talent. And, and Sean had been working hard all day. Now it's about 8 o'clock, and, and we're almost done with the episode. And he just looks at me like, I can't do I'm burnt out. I'm uh, like toast. And he's like, I need to go to bed. This is Mr. Night Owl, usually, but he was, you know, he had just no gas left in the tank. And he's supposed to be the youth leader. So I'm looking, I'm thinking, I don't got any gas left either. And the kids are going, can we watch the next episode? And the remote's going, yeah, this will be easy. <laughs> so I just turned on the next episode, and we sit around. And, 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 and it was just one of those sweet times of fellowship. But I knew in my spirit, you know, the next night I had the older kids there that were there the night before. And we had a lot of repeat visitors. And so they're there, and, 
and the kids, and I looked at him, and I just felt like God said, you tell Sean to share what he was going to share, but with these kids. I said, Sean, why don't you share? I got just a little word of encouragement. I want to tell the kids something, um, but you go first. Now, have you ever gone to one church, you listened to the message, and then you got in the car, and you turned on the radio, and you're driving home, and the preacher on the radio just preached what the preacher you just listen to or or you just turn you know to a diff, totally different show and it's the same message what you just do, do these preachers get together and like go everybody teach on this this week you know no but we have the holy spirit and this is a walk of faith and in this walk of faith when we you know i love that someone will come and say man you just taught on that and guess what my friends over at living stone they said their pastor taught on the same passage and I'm like, well, I didn't talk to Bill Barley. No, I don't, you know. I mean, we didn't, conf you know, make a little, hey, let's do this passage together. It's the Spirit of the Lord sometimes has the same message from two different guys. So I'm like, Sean, you go first. Except guess what? A little crumb stole my whole study. He goes, kids, let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. Now listen to this. I, I have no idea what he's going to share, but I'm going to read you what he read, these three verses. He reads these three verses. Now, I'm pondering my study for you guys on Romans, right? Listen to this. He says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with all humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. And do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but for the interests of others. And have this attitude in yourselves, which he said was also in Christ. You know, Christ looked out for others. He said, so he tells the kids, I have to confess, you know, I'm, he, he's working at the crazy shirts there on the Leete Drive, and some guy came in, and he didn't look too fancy, I guess, and he's like, who's this guy think he is? He's not going to buy her. These shirts are $40 a piece. And they, you know, he looks like a bum. And, and he said, I caught myself judging this person. I don't even know them. I ju I'm just supposed to be selling them. Sh I'm supposed to be a salesperson. But I'm judging by outward appearance. And, and it's not right. I'm somehow acting like I'm better. And then he said he went to lunch. And there was a, a, a guy that looked kind of like he was homeless with a little kid. And the little kid, they, they ordered something. And the, the, the little kid said to dad, dad, did you order the same thing I did? And the dad said, no. Why not? And the dad said, so we could share. And, and Sean said, it just got him because he's sitting there going, who's that guy think he is? He can't even afford this place. And, and then he was convicted. That guy was sharing his meal with his kid and showing more love than, he's like, who am I to judge? You know, we, we get, we, and I hate to tell you this, but even when it comes to the gospel, some of you are snooty and you need to repent. Because the gospel's for everyone. I don't care what position in life they are, how much money they have or don't have, how they dress or don't dress. God said the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. Not just for the best dressed or the ones with the best jobs or the ones that make a good income and contribute to society. The gospel's for everyone. And Habakkuk said, we're supposed to live from faith to faith, right? The righteous man lives from faith to faith. But he said right before that, the same verse, behold the proud one, his soul is not right within him. There's something wrong with us being prideful about our faith. We can't act like we're better than someone else because we have faith and they don't. Or we have our own special whatever slant on the faith that those other guys don't have. So we're more like, you know, we're up here and they're down here. Is that the right attitude in the gospel? The proud one, it says, is, his soul's not right. It's not the right way to be. And I was, as that little rat, Sean, he's stealing my study. But he didn't know this verse, or at least he didn't share it. There's a verse in James, what James says. Be careful in verse 1 of Chapter 2, he says, My brethren, don't hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of personal favoritism. Verse 2 of James, he says, For if a man comes into your assembly and he's 
you know, with gold rings and dressed in fine clothes. And, 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 and there comes in a man that's poor in dirty clothes. He says, you, James said that they paid special attention to which guy? To the rich guy. And they said to him, here, you sit here in the good place. And to the poor man, they said, oh, you stand over there, you know, or sit down in the back or by the footstool, you know. And, and James rebukes the church. He tells them, verse 4 of James chapter 2, Have you not made distinctions amongst yourselves and become judges with evil motives? He says, Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith? You know, one thing about a poor person is they are way more rich in faith because every day they're counting on God to just get them through the day. And they see the miracles of the hand of God provide for them. And they seem to be more grateful. I mean, on a whole. I'm not saying every one of them is, but on a whole, I'd, you know, I've seen a lot more grateful poor people. And a lot of entitled rich people. That was one of the things that just kind of irked me on our cruise. We were there and the, there were people just... There's this man named Kai on the cruise. His job is like the head of all the hotel operations on the, on the ship. It's a floating city, that Pride of America ship, you know. And he's got 2,000 people to look after, and he's got people standing there going, my room had a, you know, a duty fur ball in the corner. I want an upgrade. You know, and, and they're working it, you know, to get a, something out of the guy, and they're complaining about anything. I told my kids, you know, we had some stuff go wrong. And I told the, I went down to the auntie, I said, you know, the, the drawer, the tracks, they fell off in the, when you pull the drawer out. And I, I told her, I said, if I had a screwdriver, I'd fix it. And Raquel was with me, she's going, he would. <laughs> and uh, I thought, you know, I don't wanna bug him about that. It's just the two little metal tracks, couple screws on each side could be put back together real easy. But the lady's like, no, no, we'll take care of it. You know, and thank you for telling us. And and, and she's like ready for, you know, because she, she must get yelled at all day long. It's a terrible job. You know, the complaint center or whatever, you know, the fix-it center. I don't know what they call that. That poor girl, I didn't, you know. And, and then the kids had told me that the, the shower in their, in their cabin, when you take the shower after like one or two minutes, it's got a little lip that high. And it's full of water. And the drain, when they had to turn it off and wait for five minutes for it to go down and turn it back on and keep showering. So I told the lady, I said, I think something's wrong. Oh, yes, that's not supposed to do that. You know, we'll have it fixed right away, sir. I'm really sorry. It's okay. It's just, you know, it's a ship. I mean, constant maintenance is okay. And <laughs> I listened to people, just this poor guy, Kai. <laughs> and at the end of the cruise, I was going to put the comment card to say, thank you for this great waiter we had, and this other person did a great job, and, and this other And I would tell my kids, attitude of what? Gratitude. You know, don't, just be grateful, man. Don't, like, that's just, how unbecoming is it to have someone come up and just, nye, 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 about something that, you know, okay, your toilet paper wasn't folded in a little triangle at the end of, you know, the roll or what. I mean, what are you, oh, we have gotten to where, I'm thinking, did they enjoy their vacation? Or did they just enjoy that they got to yell at someone and then beat on them verbally, tongue lash them, and, and think they were better than them. Because that was the problem. I saw the attitude. What's the attitude? Of the, I mean, you can have a problem and you can say, hey, we got a problem. Can we get this taken care of? But you don't have to beat down the person who's, who's there having the job of having to fill in the request for the maintenance guy or take care of this or whatever it is. You know, you can just say, hey, you know, just got a question. You know, can we get this tended to? So I went up at the end and I told the fellow, I, I want to just say, I had to listen to like four people chew on him at the very last morning of the cruise. And I, my waiter kept saying, you should go tell him your drawer fell out. You should tell him that this happened. You should tell him you found that. And you should. And I'm like, Dave, I'm not here to complain. And he kept telling us at the beginning, we had the same waiter each night. And he kept telling us. And finally he goes, he figured out I was a pastor. He's like, pastor, I know you're not going to do it in a mean way, but you should say it in a nice way. So at least they give you something nice if you ever come back. You know, they'll, they'll like, you know, comp, comp you something. Because these people, they gripe about anything just to get upgraded to a new room. And you could have had new rooms with all the stuff that happened to you. Easy. 
And I'm like, it's stupid little stuff. You, we're here to enjoy the vacation. You know? I mean, they're making the beds. They're doing the laundry. They're, 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 they even turn down your sheet and put a little mint and fold the towel into a little cute animal. Oh, did you see our animal posts? If you, if you follow my wife on Facebook, you know, we got elephants and we got, uh, we got uh, it, gorillas and different, you know, we got all the little towels. Th those girls are creative. They make these cool little animals out of your towels. And, and we just like said, this is fun. But if you get an attitude that you are better than anyone else, let me, let me just point this out from Habakkuk because this might help your week this week. Habakkuk says that that prideful person he, that doesn't have his soul right within him. He goes on and described him. I don't know if you noticed that. I read it to you. But he describes them as a person that is sitting there having, well, an appetite that is never satisfied. Their appetite grows and it's never, it's like shoal, he says. It's like death, never satisfied. And he gathers to himself all this stuff and collects all this stuff. And yet, there's no rest. There's no, to the person who acts like they're better than someone else, let me point this out. They will never have in their spirit inside this place of satisfaction, this, this place of rest for their soul. They won't be at rest inside. Now, how valuable is being at rest in here for you? I mean, is it good for us, you know, when we're angst and, and stressed out? And, and, and by the way, some of you are stressed out because you're judging other people. You're thinking you're better than them. Even To listen to Sean confess to the kids, I thought I was better than that person, and then I saw he was better than me taking care of his kid. I'm just being selfish taking care of myself thinking, what's he doing in this restaurant? He doesn't even deserve to be in this restaurant. And it was interesting because one of the boys said, boy, that was a great, it really spoke to him. I figured if it spoke to him and I was just about to do the same study, a little rat, then must be the Lord wants me to, you know, it's interesting how the Spirit of the Lord, and it just happens to be what Habakkuk said. We cannot become prideful. And by the way, if we do, you're not going to, if you act like, yes, I'm here to study the book of Romans and become better than everyone else. You know, we're going to learn it verse by verse in depth. And now I'm somehow holier than the other Christians. You're not going to be satisfied no matter what I teach you. You're not. But if you can receive this right now, that we are all, all looked at as equal in the eyes of the Lord. We are all granted this great favor of God, the good news of the gospel, that, that he came to give salvation to everyone. And if we just start with that humble attitude, man, it, Paul said it, he was just saved by grace through faith. He, he knew it was the grace of God. And if God could save him, his attitude was, can God save anyone else? Yeah. And if we could stay humble, you will get so much more out of the book of Romans. Because it really does take a humble heart going in to really come out with such deep richness. This book will enrich your life. Of all the books of the New Testament to take a person and help them out of struggles. When they're, when they're struggling with, say they're stuck in bad habits and they need to tr be transformed into you know, a, a new style of life, a, a freedom from those things. You're not going to receive the, the truth that's in here if you're going in like this. Good thing I'm here. They need me. I'm better than everyone else. If you act like that, your soul's not right within you. And you're going to miss out on so much what God has. And I have seen so many people be used in our little fellowship for extending a hand of mercy to someone who's passing by that's on a, having a really bad time. There's a man that was here this morning, Daniel. Daniel, are you here? I don't, I think he might have left. Slender, not my son, Daniel, another Daniel. He asked if he could get up here and share in a couple of weeks. He wanted to tell the homeless that he was homeless, that he was on drugs, and that he just looked, he said, I looked to the man upstairs. I said, I need your help. And now this week he starts a job making 70000 a year in Waimea. And he's, and he's, 
you know, he's gotten clean and he's he just he's like, God, help me. I want to tell him that you, you just got to. Where do we have to look? Turn your eyes upon who? Jesus. You know, he said, I just need to get my eyes off myself and look to the one that can save me. And that's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Now, if you would have met him a couple months ago, you would say, strung out addict. But does God redeem lives? Yeah. And we get the privilege, the privilege of sharing the power of God. It's, it's, it's wrapped up in this good news that Jesus died for all of us. Let's stay humble about it. That way we can share with whoever God puts in front of us. Whether they're of good, st high stature or low stature in our society, doesn't matter. God loves everyone. And that's where we're going to, that's the springboard now for what comes in the, in the last half of this chapter. Next week I'm going to go through the whole last half of this chapter to, to knit together the, Paul is a master builder of thoughts. He, he puts stuff, click, click, click. Like, like, like to me, it's just like putting the foundation. This is the foundation, guys. It takes a little while to lay a foundation. But when you get a good solid foundation and it's all done, concrete's all dry, the rest of the house starts to go up real quick. So next week, we're going to snap up some of the walls, frame up some of this thing, and you'll see some really interesting things. And some of you have wrestled with, with some of your friends maybe that, they struggle with different areas of sin. You're going to see next week the framework for how to help them. And maybe it'll be you that gets helped as we look at the rest of this chapter of Romans chapter 1. So read ahead for me if you get a chance a little bit. One of the gals told me she read the whole book of Romans this week. Yay! It's my superstar student. I'm just uh, so grateful that somebody, you know, I'm a teacher. Teachers love it when the students read, you know. It's like I ask them, friends, did your kids read this? No. Yeah, the whole, nobody wants to read the thing. I'm like, they want me to give it to them, spoon feed it to them, tell them everything they need to know, but they don't want to actually read it. I just came from a different era where we actually wanted to know. Guess what? We read. We studied. We want, I want to know. But if you just do me, just humor me, okay? Read half a chapter for next week. And I'll see if I can't share some things that might enrich your your understanding of it. So that's what we got for you for today. Let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for, for your love that is all-inclusive. And Lord, give us all humble hearts that we could hear this message and we could apply it, Lord, to those you put in our path this week. That we would be no better, no worse than anyone, but just, well, sinners saved by your grace. And for that, we're really grateful, Lord, that you're a gracious God. And we thank you for the gift of your son and for that salvation. We, we, we pray it in his name. Thank you, Lord. And everyone that agree with me said? Amen. 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 Could I have the worship team come up and we'll sing a closing song? And uh, let you go. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.